What's up, gangsters? How about another installment in the Spitfire adventure? Uh, yeah, so first, though, I want to get some housekeeping and some questions out of the way. Uh, let's do the questions first. I apologize to all of you guys who have left questions on previous episodes that I have not addressed. Uh, I just figured I'd let them stack up a little bit and uh, then deal with all of them at once. So, let's get right into them. Most of these are about washes. So, this first one says, hang on a second here, let me get it where I can actually see it. Okay, I used to do models of my stepdad when I was a kid and now I'm getting back into it. Uh, I have a couple of questions here, it goes. Since I am using acrylics to paint my models, should I put a matte varnish on it before I do my washes? Would I be better off using the Tamiya enamel washes like you're doing, or should I do the oil paint way? Okay, so two questions there. The first one is, do you need a matte varnish before you do your washes? No, you don't, you don't need any kind of a clear coat before you do washes as long as you have a material differential, okay? What I mean by that is you're using enamel on top of an acrylic or on top of a lacquer and the mineral spirits that are used to remove excess washes should not have any effect on the underlying base coats, color coats, whatever you want to call it. So there's really no need to put a clear coat on there to seal it. Um, and definitely, typically not a flat coat. You can do washes on a flat or a gloss surface, uh, but the effect is going to be different and which one you choose really depends on what you're after. If you want a grimier, kind of dirtier look, then you can put it on a flat coat because it is going to stain a little bit more. If you want your washes to be really tight and you want them to flow really well, then you need to, to use a gloss. But the truth is that most of the acrylics and lacquers that we use have at least a semi-gloss kind of sheen. I mean, this little Spitfire thing is a perfect example because you can see, um, you know, that MRP, maybe this is not the best way to show it, but the MRP has a natural semi-gloss to it that's perfect for washes. So, and a lot of acrylics are the same way, especially what I call the normal ones. Um, you know, like the Vallejos and AKs and, and so forth. Um, you know, some of the Tamiya flats are truly flat, AK real color. Well, I guess they're actually lacquers. We don't really know. Uh, anyway, don't want to get into that. The second one was uh, Tamiya enamel or oil. They're really, I mean, for all practical purposes, they're the same thing. Uh, oil paints uh, have uh, a resin in them that is very similar to what's in your typical enamel. Enamels use what's called an, called an alkyd resin, which is basically just a synthetic version of what's in a traditional oil paint. And you can even get alkyd oils in, in the tube. Uh, Windsor & Newton makes them. So again, it's really kind of six of one half dozen of the other, but you will find that they behave a little bit differently. Um, the amount of pigment, the density of the, of the pigment, uh, as far as the color goes, um, it, the way that the binders and the oils react with mineral spirits, there's just going to be some subtle differences to the way that they behave. But for all practical purposes, you can substitute one for the other. And with oils, you get way more color choices, obviously. Okay, next question. Uh, I have noticed that the Tamiya panel line wash, when it dries, doesn't leave as much pigment, pigment behind as you think it will. Do oils do the same thing? Yeah, this is a thing. They always look really awesome when, you're, when they're wet because they're super dark and dense. And, you know, that's because the pigments are suspended in a, in a little fluid layer and they just look more dense. And then when they dry and that fluid layer is all gone... All you're left with is the pigment and it's just not, you know, it's just not as impressive. And it can be a little bit frustrating, but the thing to do is just to go back and do a second or a third or however many uh, applications you need. And yes, the same thing is, is going to happen with oils, but you have a little bit more control over it because you decide how dense it's going to be based on how you mix it with mineral spirits. Okay, uh... 
I bought the gray Tamiya panel line wash. I have no idea where to use it. On which colors would you recommend its use? Okay, so what I generally am trying to do with washes is use a darker version of the base color. And honestly, I have the gray one too, and I almost never use it, at least straight out of the bottle, because it's a pretty light gray. So it honestly is almost never a darker version of the, of the base color. What I end up doing is mixing it with black or, or the dark brown to, to get a darker version of the base color. Uh, so, you know, I can't really tell you exactly which colors you kind of have to decide for yourself based on what you're trying to achieve. Okay, uh, whoops, lost my screen there. Um, wow, you'd think that I just got this phone. Okay, uh, is it possible to strip the paint if you're too heavy on the wash cleanup? I've avoided the Tamiya panel wash even though I'd like to buy it because of needing to use thinner to remove it and I fear this would destroy the Vallejo Tamiya etc. acrylic paint underneath. Is this a valid concern considering how easily it's normally stripped by thinners and alcohols after curing? Okay, the kind of the fundamental thing that I see here is this sort of generalization of thinners. Uh, and that's one that just makes the, the hair on the back of my neck stand up because it is such a misused and overused term that applies to so many different things. I mean, it's basically the equivalent to calling, you know, uh, I mean, to just talking about cars. Uh, so uh, thinners can be mineral spirits. They can be lacquer thinner. They can be alcohol-based thinners. They can be water. Uh, so... I, I try to be more specific, and that's why I get so militant sometimes about nomenclature. So with Tamiya panel line, uh, accent colors, and any enamel material, the thinner that you need is mineral spirits. And I really recommend sticking straight to, to just straight up 100% mineral spirits. My rule is if it doesn't say 100% mineral spirits on the bottle, I don't use it. And the reason is because... Sometimes if it just says enamel thinner, and Testers makes one, Tamiya makes one, Humbrol makes one, it doesn't say 100% mineral spirits on the bottle because they've put other things in there. Um, like, and, and a common thing is xylene, and xylene is a very hot uh, solvent. And if you use that as your uh, eraser for excess panel line washes, yeah, you could very well damage your color coat. I've uh, seen lots of people do it, uh, just not realizing that what they're using has got something in it that, that's more aggressive. So the answer is, um, you'll be fine, but stick to 100% mineral spirits. It really is a, a good rule of thumb. Okay, this is from the last episode. Uh, my kit's canopy closed version will not fit at the rear of the canopy no matter what I try or how I look at it. I qualify this by looking at the balance of the fit around the canopy, sills, and across the top of the piece. This all fits well and flush. I am left with this infuriating almost one millimeter gap at the rear where your thumb was in the video here. And I can only conclude this is another Tamiya related issue. Yes, I said another Tamiya related issue. Okay, look, Tamiya is not perfect. I mean, they, they, they do great, but yeah, sometimes you're going to find some, some, some issues that are just part of the way that the parts are molded. And that seems to be the case a little bit with the rear portion of the fuselage on this thing, basically from the back of the cockpit uh, to um, the vertical stabilizer. I I've seen it in almost every photo that people have sent me of that area where there's a slight misalignment and in my case, that created a little bit of a gap on one side at the rear of the canopy. And I, and I had to run a file across there to flatten that out. And when I did that, um, things were, were pretty good. One millimeter, that's pretty bad. I'm not sure what's going on there. I, I, I would not expect to see uh, ever a gap like that on any Tamiya kit. Um, because while they do sometimes have flaws... They're generally pretty minor. Um, 
so I, I do think that there is a little bit of an issue with uh, with this thing with the fuselage. Um, it's been discussed a lot since I brought it up, and 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 the uh, issue that I had with the uh, horizontal stabilizer being a little too wide, um, which is still a little bit of a mystery. I'll say it again. There's just no way that you can physically screw that up. So, um, But with something like this, with a one millimeter gap at the back of the canopy, I think you really have to stop and investigate things a, a bit closer uh, and see what's up with that. Okay, housekeeping. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I mentioned uh, on the last episode that the uh, instructions don't seem to deal with drilling the hole to mount the Morse code light on top of the fuselage. And <laughs> of course I was wrong about that because it is in the instructions. It's right there in the upper sort of left-hand corner of step one. Uh, and also I think uh, in yeah in in step three it's it's kind of hard to see and they're telling you to cut it out with a knife rather than drill it out which to me is kind of ridiculous I think you're better off to just you know leave a little bit of a mark there and then when you assemble the two halves together then go ahead and drill it out like normal so I think that that handles that uh, now, one thing that got brought up um, after the last episode where I was going on about the masks was, is this really fundamentals or is this a little bit more advanced? And it's a fair point, I guess. Um, but, uh, I mean, I get that, you know, if you're just starting out, you're probably not going to have purchased uh, something like a silhouette portrait cutting machine. Um, and you may want to go straight to decals as opposed to masking and painting the uh, insignia and the markings. But when I decided to do this thing, um, it, it really was not intended to be just like basic, like the simplest necessarily. <laughs> of course, I never do anything the simplest way. Um, I just really wanted it to be about what I consider to be the core skills that everybody needs. And honestly, I do consider being able to mask and, and paint insignia to be a core skill because it's really not that hard and it is a far better solution in pretty much every case than using a decal. Yeah, doing decals is also a core skill. Uh, but I, I feel like that uh, if more people tried to uh, mask and spray their insignia that they would see that it's it's you know not really as advanced as as you might think so yeah that's a fair point but i also just wanted to kind of give you guys a good uh, view of how i was going to do that process because i'm going to be using masks all the way through this project uh, as you will see in this episode so uh, with all of that, I want to get on to it uh, because this episode is already long and I already don't like this episode. It's the it's the lot of discussion about the why, which I think is important, um, but uh, it does get long. And so if you want to skip like the first 30 minutes, then you'll get to the actual part of the painting as opposed to me just talking about how I'm going to do the painting. So at any rate, let's get to it. Let's do some paint. All right, time to get into some painting. Uh, but first, you'll notice uh, a few things going on with the little Spitfire here since uh, we last looked at it. First of all, I've obviously been uh, playing around with some sandpaper and steel wool and things, and I've done some paint scuffing, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and I don't think it's ever too early to start screwing up your paint. And I don't mean literally screwing up your paint. I mean starting to do things that will build up in layers to produce the final patina that I'm after. I uh, it, One of the things that makes me cringe the most in uh, model making discussions on the old interwebs is when dudes get all done with their painting and they say, okay, now I'm ready to start weathering. I'm like, yeah, yeah, really? Well, I mean, you know, why not start that weathering a long time ago, even when you're doing your primer? 
that at least is how I look at it. And uh, so, yeah, I did some scrubbing and I like the uh, tonal variety that I'm already starting to build in here. It's going to be subtle and chances are it won't even show and maybe that'll be fine because like right here, uh, my steel wool got a little out of hand and I ended up doing a lot more than I really intended to. And, but then I decided, well, okay, so maybe that's just a patch where the paint's lighter. These things happen. But if I end up not liking it, I'll just bury it, never know the difference. And there's going to be a roundel covering a big part of that anyway, so no big deal, not going to worry about it. All right, the next thing you will notice is that I've got some uh, MRP uh, Super Silver on there, which is my go-to bare aluminum, and I'm going to need that for my uh, chipping work. And I don't intend to just beat the stuffing out of this aircraft, but uh, Spitfires very commonly had uh, wear from foot traffic on the wing route, so I'm going to want to include that on both sides, maybe a little bit around the fuel filler cap, maybe around the cockpit access, and a little bit on the leading edge of the wings. So, got to have that in uh, preparation before I go any further. Now, what you will not be able to notice is that there is some uh, hairspray on there. Uh, it's really hard to see hairspray, uh, but you can kind of tell on the uh, around the fuel filler cap there, it has a little bit more sheen than the surrounding paint. Uh, you kind of see that. That's kind of what you want. What I do um, is I decant the hairspray into this handy little bottle and I put it down with my airbrush only where I want it. There's definitely no need to uh, spray the entire model, uh, which is what you're going to do if you try and shoot it right out of the can. Um, and, I, and, I, and I do basically two, maybe three layers. Um, I kind of have to go by gut feel a little bit because, like I said, it is very hard to see the stuff once it's uh, once it's dry and, and really while you're spraying it it's 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 practically impossible to see it um, as it's going down on that uh, aluminum uh, paint so again you just kind of have to to uh, trust your instincts now as to the can of hairspray itself this is what I use I use this trace and may uh, Ultrafine Mist number three. Why do I use this? Because this is what Mike Rinaldi got me started on with his books, and uh, it works. Obviously, uh, I, I mean, I think hairspray is, I don't, you know, I think it's probably kind of like lacquer thinner, and there's not a whole lot of difference between brands, but again, I'm, you know, I, 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 it's one of those things where. I can't really know what's in that can, and so I really need to stick with what I know works. Uh, but obviously that brand may not be available everywhere, and some of you guys in other parts of the world may have to uh, you know, do some experimenting and, and figure it out yourself. And I, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of uh, hairspray chipping theory with this video because uh, that can run long and I've got uh, I've got quite a bit of that I've got a couple of videos dedicated to hairspray chipping in particular with lacquer but the number one thing that I recommend with with uh, hairspray chipping uh, and really any kind of chipping chipping fluid chipping if you're gonna you know if you want to use the the ready-made stuff from AK or, or ammo or whatever is experimentation. You really need to practice with hairspray chipping because it's alchemy. I can tell you all day long exactly how I do it and you're not going to be able to repeat it because it just a lot of it comes down to feel and what's actually happening right there in front of you while you're doing it. So you really do need to practice before you bail into uh, doing it on uh, you know something that, that, that matters to you. Uh, but nonetheless, I feel like I'm ready to move into actual paint. And that means that I have some decisions to make and I got to talk about masking. So let's do that. 
Um, I normally will start an aircraft model paint on the belly, uh, but for a couple of reasons I'm not going to do that this time. The main reason is because I'm still not completely committed to which uh, scheme I'm gonna do. I'm not doing any of these. I'm gonna be cutting my own masks for my own, you know, for call letters and, uh, and and it's not gonna be one that everybody else has already done, hopefully. Um, but I kinda wanna do one with the black and white on the bottom and I'm trying to find one in my pile of reference photos that uh, that will work for that, but I'm just not there yet, so not gonna start on the bottom. The other reason is because with the way this kit goes together on the bottom, I really need to already have the landing gear in there and have those pieces on the bottom uh, stuck in there. And uh, I don't yet. And I, with Spitfires, especially, one of the decisions is do you paint the insides of the wheel wells uh, yet or not? Um, and I, and I, they generally, at least on later ones, tend to be the same color as the rest of the underside of the aircraft. Um, I had put some silver in there just in case, but uh, anyway, I have to decide uh, what's going on there. The other reason, as you can see already there, is that with all of the, you know, warding around that these things go through, the bottom tends to get scratched. And, and I always end up having to do a lot of touch-ups. So, at any rate, I'm going to start with the top. So now, the next decision uh, is uh, what kind of camouflage, uh, hard edge or soft edge. Now, uh, some of you guys may already be getting wound up to say, oh, well, Spitfires, they always had hard edge camouflage because they were painted at the factory with rubber mats for masking. And I'm going to say, anytime you run across somebody like that, you need to try to get them into a wager for like a thousand bucks because that's easy money. <laughs> the simple fact is that Spitfires, as with everything Spitfires, uh, uh, yeah, are all over the map and there is no rule. I have in my stack of 432 Spitfire reference images, I can show you early and late with both hard and kind of soft and very soft camouflage. Some of them were sprayed in the field, some of them were, the earlier ones as I understand it, were sprayed at the factory using the rubber mats. Um, but even then, you'll see early Spitfires with relatively soft edged camo. So do whatever you want, but you have to make that decision at this point because that dictates how the masking is going to go on and, and in, to a certain degree, what kind of masking materials you're going to use. So, um, if you're going to do uh, soft edged, you may not have to mask at all. You can freehand the camo. If you're really good and really confident, then by all means, there's no reason you can't freehand camo uh, like this. Um, and, you know, avoid having to do any masking at all. But for me, even if I'm going to freehand, I, I kind of want a, a guide to go by. Because what I'm going to end up doing is working each section of the color uh, completely. Like I'm going to do all of the browns first, and I'm going to go through the entire black basing process where I put down the marble layer, uh, then the blend layer, and then maybe even do some post shading before I even start on the green stuff. And so I kind of want to have that delineated so that I'm not spraying brown all over the whole thing. Although, if you want to, you really could spray the entire thing brown. Uh, but for me, that's just kind of a waste of effort, and I don't really want it to affect the green uh, as it definitely would. I've already got the brown primer on there for that. So, even if I were going to freehand this, one of the first things I would want to do is sort of create myself a little bit of an outline. And I could do that by just freehand sketching it with a pencil, uh, you know, a white pencil, whatever. Um, but I, I, I don't necessarily like to do that. Uh, I, I have tried it. Doesn't just, just doesn't work out that great for me, partly because of my dexterity and um, I also just kind of like having the confidence of knowing exactly, you know, how the, how the camo is going to look. So what I have started doing with these, is what I did on my last Spitfire project, is I cut these out. And Tammy is great about this because at least one of the pictures that they give you in the materials with the kit is 
is going to be to scale. And if it's not, you just scan it and scale it up and print it back out. Um, but with this, what you can do, obviously, if you don't mind destroying this, is you can just cut this directly out of this piece of paper, or if you have a copier, you can copy it and then cut those out. But what I did was I cut all these out and then taped them to the model, and I just very lightly sprayed the, uh, in that case, it was, it was the uh, uh, ocean gray um, to get the lighter color, and that gave me just enough of an outline that I could then have confidence with where I wanted to work with my freehand uh, stuff. So, uh, I kind of need masks anyway. And what I'm doing this time is rather than cutting all these out by hand, uh, is I'm going back to what I was showing you guys in the last episode using my Silhouette uh, uh, Portrait 2 and cutting them out of the uh, Aura Mask. And what I did to create these was basically the same process that I went through before, except this time I actually went into Fusion 360 and uh, used the drawing tools there because I'm more familiar with them. I like them better than the drawing environment inside of Silhouette uh, Studio. And uh, generated a PDF and uh, uh, that automatically created the cut lines. This time I did it, you know, got it done correctly. And uh, boom, I've got a set of masks and hopefully they're gonna work. The challenge is getting stuff that, that will drape over the fuselage uh, and, you know, tie into the wing camo. And I haven't tried any of these yet, so I'm gonna see here pretty quickly if these are gonna work. Now, um, so, so that's how I'm going to get my basic outline uh, down. But again, back to hard edge versus soft edge. Um, if you're going to do soft edge and you're not going to freehand, well then how are you going to mask? Well, a lot of people will use the, uh, the blue tack trick or any kind of poster tack, whatever you like, where you roll them into little bitty sausages that you lay down to follow these curves and you spray kind of over the, the top of that and it'll create a nice soft edge. That works really well. It is kind of time consuming, but it, it's, a good, it's a good method. Uh, I've done it before and I, and I like it. Uh, another thing that you can do is, again, cut all these out, either you know by hand or the way that I've done it, and then use the, uh, the blue tack to, to create a little bit of a spacer. So in other words, you put little dots or little sausages of blue tack all along this outline and then stick your paper mask to the top of it. And that way it's spaced away from the surface just enough that when your spray is coming down from the top, it'll leave a little bit of a feather edge under there. That's the way that Paul Budzik does it. And you can really get as much of a feather edge as you want using that technique because the closer to the surface you get, obviously the tighter the spray pattern is gonna be and the less it's gonna feather. Now, I decided before I even started this thing that I was gonna do hard edge on this one because all my previous Spitfires have been soft edge. So I'm gonna do hard edge on this one. And again, that's why I went with the Aura Mask material because for a, a, a pure hard edge, obviously the masks have to be stuck directly down to the surface of, of, the, of the workpiece. So that's what I'm gonna start doing now is uh, sticking my masking on there and seeing how they all fit. All right, so it's the next day and I am pleased to report that uh, for the most part, my masking project project went better than expected and I was actually really happy at how how uh, easy and painless it was. I, I probably spent four or five hours making these masks and that might sound like a lot but I only spent I don't know 30 minutes or a half an hour putting them on and this was my first try. I fully expected to have to go back and adjust some of these but at least for what I'm going to do right now, I think these are, are just fine. And again, here's the thing. I Now I'm going to have a set of Spitfire masks that I can use for any future project, even if I need to scale them up or down uh, for 172nd or 132nd, whatever. So I think it's time well spent. And uh, uh, 
I just again overall I just think this was a, a good way to go you can see that I had a you know some uh, challenges there around the uh, canopy which you know you'd expect because trying to convert 2d plan views into 3d masks is is a challenge it's going to require some fudging and I had to uh, tinker with it a little bit on this side but like you know back here on the tail oh man I just it's almost like I planned it that way it worked out good so I'm going to uh, carry on with the next step and if what I was saying about my plan here was a little bit confusing um, I think this will help clarify it so what I've uh, got here is uh, some uh, MRP I don't know it's just some light brown color something that uh, will not uh, interfere with anything and I've mixed it up about two to one with some rapid thinner and um, I'm just going to put a little bit of that in my airbrush and uh, I'm just I'm not gonna do the whole thing right here on camera just enough so that you guys understand what I'm up to okay so I'm just gonna dust that on there not again not trying to actually paint anything yet okay the only reason for this is so that when I peel this mask off I can get it to there we go I have just enough of a ghost outline there and I'm gonna save these because I may end up putting these same ones back on I don't know I may uh, I may have to cut a new set we'll see if I do no big deal but I am gonna try and uh, and save these anyhow there you go so you can see now I've got the ghost outline of that section. And so what that will enable me to do, I thought I was going to do all of the brown stuff first, but then I realized that I don't have my RAF Earth Brown yet. I forgot to order some. So I'm going to do the green first, and that may work out better anyway. Um, but the bottom line is, now I'll, I'll be able to, I'll, I'll freehand the green, but... Uh, I will be able to work the entire section uh, and so I won't waste any time you know painting doing black basing marbling all those steps uh, where I don't need to uh, I, there's no point in doing it twice so yeah there will be a little bit of an overlap along that boundary but when I come back and reapply these same masks and spray the browns that'll all go away so uh, it seems a little bit convoluted, but I think that overall what I'm doing is the most efficient process. So I'm going to carry on with that, and probably when we come back to it, it'll be when I start actually laying down some of the uh, RAF dark green. Okay, here we go. I just finished laying in the ghost outline, and you can see that I've got it now over the whole thing, and maybe now it starts to make a little bit more sense because now I have that ghost pattern over the entire surface of the aircraft and I can work confidently now on the green sections and yeah I could have again I could have traced around those with a pencil or whatever but this lots faster okay now we are starting to get into the fun part okay so for those of you not familiar with the black basing method, uh, it's just another form of pre-shading, and it's certainly not original. Uh, Matt McDougall has long been the champion of the method, but 
he doesn't even claim to be the original author. I mean, this is just another way of introducing tonal variety in your paint. And the way that uh, a lot of people do it is just by uh, manually airbrushing a random pattern uh, on what has come to be called the marble layer because it kind of looks like marble, I guess. Um, and then that's fine. Uh, but there are two issues with it that um, bugged me a long time ago. One is that it's slow. It takes forever. I mean, especially on something like 132nd scale. Uh, you know, all this very small spraying just, you know, it just, it just, eventually it just kind of becomes tedious, wears me out. The other thing is that it produces a pretty uniform pattern even in, in its randomness because everything looks like an airbrush texture. Um, and you're counting on your brain to be random, which our brains are just not very good at. So, um, I don't know, three or four years ago, however long it was, uh, I ran across these uh, R-Tool FX uh, texture templates that uh, airbrush artists use. And uh, if I can get them sorted out here, I'll show them to you. Uh, and I've done videos about this specific thing, so I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of detail here, but... Uh, these are them, and, I, and they're, they're made out of a kind of a heavy-duty paper or real lightweight cardboard, whatever you want to call it. And you can see that it's just a stencil you spray through. And uh, I love them, other than the fact that they are kind of starting to come apart, uh, because they make this particular operation so much faster and easier. Okay, so it's pretty simple. No rocket science. Just going to place it right there on the workpiece and just spray through it. That's it. That's all there is to it. And you get that sort of different looking texture. Okay, some hard edged sort of splotches mixed in there. So what I tend to do is I, I tend to do both things. I do some by hand. I do some with the stencil. Um, one thing that I try to do a lot is I will change up, uh, obviously, the position so that I'm not repeating patterns and also vary the distance that you spray through. Okay, obviously, if you spray real close, you will get really hard-edged splotches like that. But pull it away from the surface, even just a little bit, and it changes the nature of things, and you will get a softer-edged splotch. So you just kind of end up playing around with them and generating as much randomness as, as possible. And... The thing that I see a lot of people who use these doing that kind of makes me cringe is that they will still cover the entire surface of the workpiece with this same sort of effect. And so again, even though it's random, it still ends up looking kind of uniform. And ideally, that's you know not what we want. We want to try and reproduce the effect of random paint degradation because it is you know it is it is a pretty random thing so it's important to try and be careful of not falling into any traps like i'll see guys use these things and they'll do a really nice job of of stenciling the texture in the middle of the panel lines but they still uh, uh, stay away from the actual panel lines and they end up with that same sort of you know almost traditional pre-shaded look where uh, the uh, the panel lines themselves are all darker because of the black underneath. And again, that's fine if that's the look you want, but the, my point is just make it intentional. Just, you know, just be aware of, of what you're doing and, 
and don't fall into those traps if you really want a random effect. So I'm going to keep working on this uh, and I'll come back and take a look at uh, how the marble layer looks when it's done. Okay, so it's less than an hour later and I'm all done with the first layer of the greens. And I wanted to point out, because you can see lots of different patterns going on here, I have a whole collection of these stencils. Um, after uh, I started using the Art Tool FX ones, which are, are these on the bottom, um, and talking about them a lot, and I'm not taking credit for any of this, this just seems to be the thing. Um, they kind of blew up and different people started making different ones. Uh, these are really nice brass ones from Ushi van der Rosten. He makes three of them. Uh, kind of a fine, medium, and, and coarse. This one, I believe, is from RB Productions, and it's fantastic because it's super, super tiny. And then I've got these two that are made by John Geigel at Masterpiece Models. So you can get uh, quite a variety there, and I think it's important to have a variety so that you can get some uh, different patterns. Okay, and what ho I hope you'll notice here, what I hope you'll notice here is that I'm using those patterns in a specific way. Uh, what I like to do is in areas where there's gonna be a, a lot of traffic and a lot of wear, I will use the smaller, tighter pattern. Uh, and then in areas where there's less of that sort of thing, further out here on the wingtip, I'll use the bigger patterns and I'll use more just freehanding. And then of course there are gonna be areas where it's just hard to get the stencil in there and so those are places where I will also uh, use the, the, the uh, I'll, just, I'll just go freehand. Um, but I try to scatter that around and do you know, different things, because what you have to keep in mind is that these things were painted by human beings, and even though, um, at least early on in World War II, they were using rubber mats as masks, they're still human beings, and there's still going to be a lot of variability in the thickness of the paint, the patterns of the paint, you know, just like the same as, as for us as model makers. You see people on YouTube especially doing all kinds of things, you know, with the way that they wave their airbrushes around, uh, you know, not, not always a good thing, but at any rate, point being is you have to keep that in mind and try and introduce some of that variability uh, early on in the process. And yeah, it may disappear by the time I've got, you know, a bunch of layers stacked up here because I will have, at a minimum, I will have three layers on this thing um, before I switch colors uh, back to the brown. Um, there will be a blend layer after this, and then I'll probably go ahead and do a, a top layer um, of post shading. And I generally try to work from dark to light as I go up in the layer stack, but I also have to be flexible because this is already turning out to be a little bit lighter on the green than I anticipated. So for my blend layer, I may go back a little just a little bit darker or a little browner or a little greener or whatever it is, I'm going to change it up. That's the most important thing is change it up, make it where it's noticeably different as you go uh, from one layer to the next. And, you know, be creative. Um, this is the part of the process for me where it starts to get fun because basically you can be as, as, as free-handed as you, as you want to be. Um, and, you, you know, and you don't really have to worry too much about the consequences because especially working with lacquers, you know, it, 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 you can make it, make it all come out in the wash. The important thing is that everything you do is intentional and controlled. And um, I'm sure you're probably also noticing that um, I obviously was not able to stay perfectly within my ghost pattern, and that's fine. I really want to go outside of it a little bit, um, but the thing that I'm sure you've already deduced is that when you've got one of these stencils laying over the top of it, it's pretty hard to see that faint outline, and so you're going to get some overlap. Um, I definitely did right here, um, and I'm not too worried about it, but uh, if, if, if you are, you know, the, again, because of working with lacquers, 
And because uh, they sand so nicely, um, if that really bothers you, then you can come back and, and you can work some of that off. Um, and, you know, you gain even more random variability by, by doing that. But I'm honestly not too worried about it because that's uh, pretty faint. And by the time I uh, do the same uh, splatter pattern in the dark earth, uh, that, you know, like I said, is all going to come out in the wash. So uh, just always remember that when you're working through these things, that this is just one layer and you shouldn't get too hung up on it being uh, exactly a, a certain way at this stage of the game. One thing I think I should mention is that these stencils are not the only way to do this. There are guys who uh, either don't like them or don't want to buy them or whatever who are using things like uh, Brillo pads or sponges. Anything that's got a loose enough weave that you can lay it down and spray through it will work. Uh, this is also a place where some guys might choose to use the salt method. I, I personally am not a fan of the salt method. Um, it, it's just kind of a mess and the salt can be kind of hard to remove. And uh, if, if there's residue, it can mess with later layers of paint or clear coats. So not a huge fan. What I do like though sometimes is using the uh, really elastic, stretchy, latex style version of masking fluid. Um, you can sponge this on, spray over it as a mask, uh, and then remove it real easily and get uh, also a nice random splatter effect. And it's a little bit more controlled, obviously, because you can see everything. You're not looking through a mask. The other thing you could do is you could even use chipping fluid and do and do you know the same sort of operation um, if you don't mind having chipping fluid all over the all over the workpiece. So I just want to emphasize this is not the only method for doing this. The key point is that that however you do it, that this is all about just getting that random effect of paint degradation. Okay, so I've been painting on this uh, off and on today. And uh, this is just kind of a little check-in. This is, uh, let's see, this is now about three layers of stuff. I decided that uh, I was going to move more towards uh, uh, a darker tone than uh, what I had going on there. Um, and so I actually came back and did more stencil work with... Uh, some of the uh, uh, RAF dark green blended with some of this 6K Russian brown, which is a little bit reddish, and I kind of wanted to do that. I wanted to darken it and give it a little bit of a red tone, and so, you know, I just kind of worked around, and again, just keeping it random. Um, I also did something that this masking system makes it real easy to do. I just grabbed one of the negative masks off of my sheet. You can see it right there, uh, which is really easy. Um, I just cut it out and uh, stuck that on there to help me, again, just to kind of keep that area right there clean and um, that's something that's a lot easier when you've got masks cut out this way obviously than it would be if you were going back and forth with with tape um, then I did something that I have actually uh, both tried and not tried before I really like working with sponges um, sponges are a fantastic texturing tool and if you're using uh, water-based or, or you know any kind of normal acrylic paint you can definitely do a lot of that because obviously you don't risk screwing up anything underneath. But I decided you know what what if I just thin this down a lot with some Tamiya lacquer thinner it's really mild and give it a, a little bit of a whirl. 
So I did that and I mixed up a third tone of green that was a, was a little lighter and a little greener. And uh, I went around and did a little bit of sponge work and it worked okay. Um, you, it's, it's subtle, but you can kind of see it like right in there, there's a patch of it. And uh, it, it's left a slight texture. Uh, but because I was very light-handed and very quick about it, um, and because I was using the Tamiya lacquer thinner, which is pretty mild, I did not screw up any of my of my paint. And what I will do is I'll go back anywhere that I see any sort of texture, and uh, and I do this pretty much between each layer anyway. Just go back and do a little spot sanding. Uh, this is a thousand grit uh, sponge. Looks like I may have a little hair stuck right here. And I'm constantly doing this as I work. Constantly looking and inspecting and spot sanding if need be uh, because there's no better time than right now to get rid of a flaw uh, at least with, with lacquers. That's one of the wonderful things about working with lacquers is that they they dry so fast that if you have an issue, you can pretty much take care of it within minutes. And um, I am pretty pretty militant about uh, any kind of textures in my paint, so I'm always doing that, and uh, that helps me end up with a, a pretty smooth finish that certainly does not require any excessive gloss coats of any kind uh, down the road. Uh, so anyway, the next thing I think I'm going to do is start working on a blend layer. And uh, so I'm going to mix up some more green and yet another shade. And uh, I'm going to thin it a lot because I really want to sneak up on this. So we'll come back and take a look here in just a little bit. Okay, I'm going to try and talk uh, about this. I've got my mask on, so hopefully I, I, I can speak clearly. But you can kind of see what I've got going on here. I'm starting to darken this up. And this is what is commonly called blend layer. Because what I'm trying to do here is blend in all of those layers that I've put down before in a way that still provides some local contrast without looking ridiculous, okay? And, and, and what I really, I hope that, that this will show on camera, but that section of the wing, the wing tip right there, to me is kind of ideal. You can see those variations with the naked eye, but they don't just scream, oh look, this is stencil work. Uh, because uh, as one of my photography mentors used to always say, if the effect is the first thing you notice, you're doing it wrong. So what I've done is I've saved this other wing tip uh, to do on camera so that you guys can kind of get an idea of, of how I go about this. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, saying this is the only way, but the basic, the basic process is, is really the same, no matter what. This is extremely thin paint. I normally don't thin MRP at all, but this is thinned like three to one, probably. Um, and you'll see just how translucent it is here in a second. Uh, because for a second, you won't even see it doing anything, all right? Now, hopefully, let me try uh, zooming in just a little bit, see how that works. Hold on. Uh, okay, let's try this. This is hard to do on camera, but I'll give it a whirl. Okay, so. You can see all of the all the variations there. And when I start spraying, 
you can see that they gradually start to disappear. And I'm not trying to spray evenly. I'm watching really closely. And if I have an area that's a little bit darker than I want it to be, then I'll, I'll concentrate on that for just a second. Put a little bit more paint there. And I'm just watching closely as I do it to see how the how, how that contrast is shifting as I work. You can kind of think of this as filtering because that's that's basically what it is. The mixture that I'm using is a bit thicker than a filter, but it is still basically basically all I'm doing is tinting the base colors. Uh, and that's all a filter does. It's just letting you tint your base colors until you get basically exactly what you want. And, and again, it's important to remember that it doesn't have to be exactly right at this stage because you can keep doing post shading all day long. You can use another layer uh, as a you can you can do another filtering layer if the tone is not quite where you want it to be if that's a little too green or a little too brown or or whatever you can come back and adjust that with another very thin filter layer that's very translucent it's also important to remember that in addition to more post shading that i'm probably going to do like i'm up to four layers on all this stuff, green now and i don't know i may end up with four more but something that it's important to remember is that there's also going to be markings and insignia on this thing. So, again, if it's not exactly perfect in a particular area, stop and think about whether or not that's even going to be visible uh, down the road uh, when things are, are closer to being finished. So, uh, this is one reason why this is, this is a lot of fun for me at this stage, because there just really is not any way that you can get it. I mean, yeah, you could get it wrong, but, you know, there's just not a lot of penalties right now. At least not permanent ones. Okay, so I'm getting into my last layer, maybe my last layer, <laughs> of, uh, of green here. And I've decided to do some more texture uh, because I'm going to go with uh, this la maybe, this maybe last layer being... Uh, being the being lighter and I want a little bit of uh, I want some darker spatters or scuffs or whatever you want to call them to come up from underneath so I'm going to use the masking fluid technique that I mentioned before and this stretchy masking fluid on a sponge is is great for this because when the bottle is new at least it's nice and thin and it and so it does naturally kind of make good patterns uh, if you have a, a light touch and so what I've done is uh, just I've gotten most of it off of the sponge and now I'm gonna just go around here and I'm just gonna sponge it on and it's important to make random motions and turn it every so often uh, turn the workpiece so that you're getting you know so that you're not getting repeats because you'd be surprised at how much uh, the human eye will pick those up so and I'm trying to kind of you know do it in a way that reflects that these are our work areas and you want to avoid um, going back over areas that you just did as they start to dry because uh, you'll see that it will uh, start to, to, to lift up. And that's part of the reason why I prefer this type of masking fluid for this operation 
over the uh, the more filmy type, uh, like the Mr. Saul, Masking Saul R that I showed you, because um, that's what's going to make this easy to remove when the time comes. And uh, I'll show you how I'm going to do that. Uh, you can go back over it, but you just have to be... You just have to be, uh, you know, deft with your with your touch, and uh, you know you can kind of see what's what's going on there. Uh, you can see the way that the that the pattern is nice and splotchy and random. I think I want to get a little bit more over there, maybe. Um, so I'm going to keep doing that, and I'm going to spray it. And then we'll come back and take a look at the results. Okay, so I've sprayed that and done a little other toning work. You can see that I have, uh, I just put a post-it note over that wing tip before I sprayed that lighter tone so that I got that wing tip left a little bit lighter, kind of like that. And then I, uh, took some really lightened tone and masked off the elevators and did just those. Um, and the thing that I use to lighten almost all my greens is this RLM 79. It's great as a lightener for greens, really all I use it for. I keep it around just for that. Um, one nice thing about working with MRP like this is that I can really just make these decisions on the fly. Like, I had sprayed my uh, same tone that I had sprayed up here, back here on the elevators, the horizontal stabilizers, and I decided I wanted to lighten those uh, elevators, and I just immediately put some masking on there. I used a post-it note on this side and, and some washi tape on this side. No issue. Um, and that's one of the great things about working with a material that dries so fast and hard like that. Now, you can see where I've removed the masking material, the uh, masking fluid, what I've got right here and what I've got right here. Um, it's I'll try to get a little bit of the light off of it so you can see it better. Now, obviously, I've got a lot of contrast there, maybe more than I want. I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to look at it for a bit, see what I think. Uh, but it's easy to tone down if I decide that I want to. I can either come back with a, another really thin layer of something slightly darker and go back the other way, or maybe I'll just work on it a little bit with sanders. Uh, sometimes I feel like sanders are my most <laughs> important painting tool uh, when I'm working with MRP because you can control the opacity so perfectly with, uh, with a sander. So, how did I remove all that masking material? It was super easy because one of the things that I did while I was doing it is I stuck a Q-tip in the jar, bottle, whatever, and got the end of it covered with that stuff. And now I have a super sticky liquid frisket remover. And you can see it just pulls it right off of there. And this is one of the reasons why I think this technique is so much better than than salt because it does essentially the same thing. I mean, the patterns may be slightly different than what you'd get with grains of salt or crystals of salt, I guess. But when it comes to removing it, this is far easier and far more effective because by doing it with this Q-tip trick, you can ensure that uh, you get all of that off there. And yeah, this is a great technique for straight uh, chipping as well. Um, and who knows, I may use it for some chipping. I don't know, we'll see. But that's where I'm at with that. And if you're looking at this and you're thinking, man, that's just too much. Well, maybe you're right. I kind of feel like maybe it is too. But this part of the process is iterative. And that's what makes each example have that random and unique ef uh, effect of paint wear that gives it a, a, an authentic look. So what I'm going to do now that I've got all this off here is go eat some dinner and then I'll come back and look at it later and see what I think. 
Okay, so it's the next day and I uh, did study on this a little harder and decided to back down the level of contrast. And hopefully that shows up on camera okay. Uh, it's, I think it's good. I, th I think I'm gonna, I think I'm going to stop messing with the green at this point. And as soon as my uh, dark earth shows up, I'm gonna move on to that. Um, I backed off that contrast by just very lightly spraying some more of the original MRP dark green. I cut it like 50 or 60 percent with Mr. Rapid Thinner and uh, just, you know, just snuck up on it. Now, if you're thinking that this is a lot of work and a lot of layers, because some of this stuff has got like, I don't know, like eight layers on it at this point. Um, yeah, I get that. Uh, but this is what it takes. I mean, if you want to create uh, you know, a lot of interesting tonal variety at kind of a micro level. It takes a lot of layers. And then and I probably will end up down the road wishing I had even more layers on this because I'll look at the work of some other guys who are really good at this, like uh, Jarek Rudzinski. I hope I said his name correctly. If you haven't seen his work on, on Facebook... Uh, he's just really, really good at doing uh, this kind of tonal variety work. And I've been studying up on some of his stuff. And um, I, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it just takes effort. Okay, there you go. I hope you guys found that useful. And I hope you'll stay tuned for the next episode. As always, much love.